Wow, what a day we're having so far, amen? Family, it's always great to be with you, and, and I, I love the opportunity that we have to get into the Word of God together. I want to encourage you, if you brought your Bibles, to take out your Bible or grab your phone and open it up to the YouVersion Bible app. If you click More, then you'll see Events, and then you'll see The Bridge. You can click that for all of our verses and our sermon notes. If you were with us, family, at the beginning of this year, you know that the Lord gave us a specific vision, a theme for 2022. Every year in the fall, the staff and I begin to pray about where we're going to go in the next year, and God has always been so faithful to lead us and guide us. And the word that the Lord gave us for this year was the word planted. And the Lord gave me that vision out of Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, that says, Blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted, everybody say planted, planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do prospers. And so the word that the Lord gave us was that as a community, that we would be planted in the word of God. And at the time that the Lord gave us this vision, we didn't know that God was also going to plant us in this building, in this community. But of course, he knew already. And so this year, really for the first time in the 20 years that I've been pastoring this church, we committed this year that we're only going to do uh, walks through specific books of the Bible a line at a time, a verse at a time, a chapter at a time. How many have enjoyed that already so far this year? It's been an amazing time just going deeper in the Word of God. Last week, my son Keaton closed out our series uh, in the Psalms, and today we are beginning a brand new series. And for the next couple of months, we're going to be walking through the book of Daniel. Our series is entitled Daniel, Lessons from Exile. And so again, if you brought your Bibles or you're following along on the Bible app, I want to invite you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel is a really interesting book. It's a prophetic book, but it's also an historical book. And it's actually divided kind of into two sections. The first six chapters of Daniel are a historical narrative of Daniel's life and the life of his three friends. And then the second half of the book is really about apocalyptic prophecy and literature, looking to the future, looking to the end times. And that's why we refer to this book as a book of the prophets. Daniel was a prophet. These stories are pretty well known, at least in the first six chapters. If you grew up in church like I did, you were always excited when the Sunday school lesson had something to do with Daniel, right? Because you were going to be talking about the lion's den or the fiery furnace and, and those kind of things. But this book really has so much to offer us. We've entitled it Daniel Lessons from Exile because I believe that what we're going to see is a, a direct correlation to the way that Daniel and his friends lived in a very difficult, tumultuous time where there was tremendous pressure around them in the world, not unlike the times that we're living in today. Would you agree? And we're going to see a great example for what it means to be people of, of, of the Lord, to be the people of God, to be people of character. People with strong convictions that inform our decisions, all for God's glory and for our good. Amen? The thing that I want to emphasize this morning as we get into this series is like every other book of the Bible, though replete with amazing stories of men and women of God living out their faith in difficult situations, that this book, like every other book of the Bible, is first and foremost about God. This is not a book primarily or, or in, in, in first or priority about Daniel as much as it is a book about God, who God is in our lives. And so Daniel, this book of Daniel, is designed to reveal the nature and the character of God. And that's all of Scripture, family. So often I think sometimes we're reading books of the Bible or stories of the Bible and our inclination is to make immediate application to our life through the correlation of the person that we're studying. But 
one of the things that we need to do first and foremost is, is we, we need to ask the scriptures and we need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us a revelation. Who is God in the midst of this? Because the more that we know about the character of God, woo, the more that we know about the heart of God, the greater faith that we're going to have to walk in obedience to the word of God. Amen? As we know his heart and his character for us. Amen. And so I believe that we're going to see in Daniel a God who is sovereign. A God who is above all things. And a God who is completely committed to his people. We're going to see a God who is with us. A God who is for us. Somebody say amen. A God who is present in the midst of our circumstance, in the things that are going on right now in the world. I know a lot of people think that God wants nothing to do with this world based upon the things that we see going on. Can I tell you, it's exactly the opposite. God still loves the world, and he is moving behind the scenes even if we don't see him. We're going to begin to recognize that attribute of God in this book of Daniel. And so the writing of the book of Daniel is around... The 6th century B.C., written by Daniel, as most scholars agree. And we're going to see that Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as we come to know them, were somewhere between 15 and 17 years old. So buckle up, because we're about to get schooled from some teeny boppers. <laughs> we're going to learn some amazing lessons of character and integrity and and godly conviction from these young, young men. Daniel and his friends were among many taken as fugitives or captives from Judah to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. The city of Babylon at the time of this writing was the largest city in the world and the Babylonian Empire was the greatest power on the planet. So let's look together at Daniel chapter 1 verse 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. First thing that I want us to recognize here is that King Nebuchadnezzar did not take Judah because of his military might. King Nebuchadnezzar took Judah because God delivered Judah into his hand. God is sovereign even in a moment that it seems like the enemy is winning. And God is using this circumstance for a far greater purpose than we can see in the moment. I want to begin by encouraging you with that same truth. Sometimes our lives are not going the way that we hope that they would go, and things are not going according to plan. And our assumption could be that the enemy is winning. But I want to tell you something, that even when our life is, is going in a different direction or it's unexpected, how many life happens to you just like me, that God is always behind the scenes. God is always working even these kind of difficult situations together for our good and for his glory. So why do we see Judah, the, the people of God, being taken captive by this pagan king? Well, I believe that we're going to see again that this is in part a result of Judah's disobedience, of the king's disobedience. And the Bible does say this in Galatians chapter 6. It says, therefore, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. God is not mocked. What we know about this story, we can read from 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 5, where it says, Jehoiakim, and again, that's the king that we just read about in Daniel 1, was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him and bound him with bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took to Babylon articles from the temple of the Lord and put them in his temple there. So King Jehoiakim, the leader of 
the people of Israel, the people of God, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so God is shifting the tide. God is not content just to allow that disobedience to continue. How many have ever realized that sometimes when we are moving in the wrong direction, God has to do something fairly significant to get us to understand what he wants to do in our lives? Anybody ever been there? And so we see that here in the people of Israel. And so Daniel and his friends are taken refugees. They're taken as captives. And they are taken 800 miles, 800 miles from their home to a foreign land with foreign and pagan customs and religions. And they're taken into a hostile social political system. There's so much against, again, keep in mind, he's 15, 16 years old. He doesn't even have his driver's license yet. There's so much against Daniel, and there's really no way that he should have survived this experience except for the truth that Daniel loved God, Daniel believed God, and Daniel obeyed God. Daniel Daniel courageously obeyed God in a time where people were compromising all around him. And what we're going to see through our study of this book is not only did Daniel survive, but he thrived. And I want to encourage you with that word today, family, that I know that we're in a difficult season and we look around and it seems like evil is prevailing everywhere that we go. And we're hoping just to get through it. We're hoping to just survive. Can I tell you, that's not God's destiny over your life, merely survival. But God is going to cause us to increase if we'll trust him. Amen? God is going to cause us to thrive if we will obey him and we will follow him. Amen? Come on, that's better preaching than your response. (laughs) Daniel didn't just survive, but he thrived. Let's look together at verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So what are Daniel and his friends facing here? Well, life is happening to them at a horrific pace. Life is happening to them in a way that is completely unexpected. Their their city is defeated, and they are among hundreds if not thousands of refugees, captives that are taken 800 miles away from their homes. They're taken away from everything that was familiar to them, every comfort zone that they possibly had. They're brought to a place that is completely different than anything that they've ever experienced before. But God has plans to give these young men incredible influence. Everybody look at me just for a moment. I want to tell you something. You are intended for influence. Every one of us, God has intended our life for influence. You don't live where you live by accident. You weren't born into the family you were born into by accident. You don't work the job that you work by accident. You haven't gone through the experiences that you've gone through by accident. We're going to see throughout the book of Daniel that God is sovereign. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. And he's calling us to be a people that will trust him with all of our hearts. And when we do, we're going to see doors open that no man can shut. And we're going to recognize that, wow, my life has a purpose beyond survival. Or beyond just what I've seen in my family before me. You were intended for influence, family. 
Can I tell you that if you're going through a difficult circumstance right now, that God is not surprised by your circumstance? He's working behind the scenes for your good and for his glory. And you know what he's calling you to do? He's calling you to draw nearer to him. Sometimes we're, we're, we're crying out, Lord, I can't hear you. Lord, what are you doing? And what we don't realize is because we're still in the midst of the volume of our circumstance. And that's why daily time with the Lord, quiet time with the Lord, setting aside moments where we can be in that secret place with God are so important, like Daniel. Because you know what? God speaks oftentimes in a whisper. And in order to hear a whisper, you got to get close. And guess what happens when we get close to the Lord? He reminds us of who we are. He reminds us that we have a life that has tremendous influence and purpose despite the things that are going on around us if we'll trust him. And so Daniel and his friends are being forced in an environment that we're all going to face in this world. And that is this, the pressure to conform. Every day we we are faced with the pressure of the world around us, the secular ideology around us, even the lie or the strategy of the enemy around us to conform. And so we need to be reminded of what the word of God says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We're going to see that the favor, the incredible influence that God granted Daniel and his friends is because they made up their mind. They drew that line in the sand that said, I'm not going to conform to the things that are going on around me. Yes, there are things that they could not control, but what they could, they did for the glory of God. Amen? And God gave them incredible favor. So initially, we see that Daniel and his friends are valued for some of the very same things that the world values people. They were valued for their status. They had come from a a noble family in Judah. They were valued for their appearance. They were good looking. They were fit. They were without blemish. They were valued even for their abilities. They were already smart young men probably who had been already devoted to the law of God and learned in the house of God. They had the ability to understand things. They were aware of what was going on in the culture. But little did King Nebuchadnezzar know what lie beneath the surface of these young men of God. The world might look at you and might look at me and they might see what they want to see or not. But that is not who we are. Amen. The enemy has no idea what's below the surface of you and me as we tap into the strength that we have in God. And that's who we really are when we are linked and tapped into who God wants us to be. Amen? I see that these men are experiencing four critical experiences that I want to identify. The first one is isolation. They're experiencing isolation from their friends, from their family, from fellowship with their community. They're experiencing isolation from from temple worship. They're alone. They're away from everything that is comfortable to them. Secondly, they are experiencing indoctrination. They're forced to learn the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. And you might think to yourself, wow, that's pretty cool. They're getting a good education. No, no. They were getting brainwashed, or they were, that was the purpose of that education, is to brainwash them, to erase the memories of their past, of their values. And instead, the training of the Chaldeans was to train them in, in things of divination and demonic activity. Because you got to remember that this, these countries, these nations, were following false gods, worshiping false gods. So it wasn't that they were learning just valuable things that would benefit them in the marketplace. They were being indoctrinated into false religion, reading omens, basically a graduate course in satanic practice. So they're isolated, they're indoctrinated, and third, they were experiencing intimidation. Can you imagine being a teenage boy, a teenage Jewish young man hitting the streets of Babylon? Absolutely overwhelming. 
The city of Babylon was an incredible site at this time in history. Its walls were over 300 feet high. These walls were 80 feet thick. History tells us that the river Euphrates ran through the center of this. I mean, it was, it was amazing. In the king's courts, there were the hanging gardens. Maybe you've heard of them. They're one of the seven wonders of the world that Nebuchadnezzar constructed for his wife. This was an overwhelming city. There was incredible intimidation, and everybody around them was not like them. One of the ways that they were intimidated as well was being required, at least as we see in the beginning of this story, to eat the food, the delicacies of the king. The food and the wine, these foods that were completely against the Jewish law. Sometimes, you know, we can look at this and go, what was the big deal? Is they get good food and good wine? At least there's one good thing happening for them. No, the thing that you have to understand that Daniel and his friends knew is that this food and this wine was first sacrificed to the gods of Babylon and then brought to the king's table. Can you imagine the intimidation of being there with all of the other servants of the king, but you know where this food has been and yet you're being required to engage and eat it. Incredible intimidation. But the thing that we see about Daniel and his friends is that their convictions inform their decisions. The last critical piece of this, so we have isolation, intimidation, indoctrination, and redesignation. That's the last piece. Nebuchadnezzar changed their names. You might think to yourself, well, that's really no big deal. I mean, they were in a different land. Can I say today that there's the most personal thing that you possess is your own name? When someone wants to take away your name, they want to remove your sense of identity and history, and that person wants to control you. And that's what they were experiencing. Everything had been taken, and now their own names. They were be being called by names they probably even couldn't pronounce or understand. So how many see that what's going on with Daniel and his three friends is not a casual internship? This is not studying abroad. They are facing the greatest single crisis of their life. And there's so much for us to learn from this. Can I tell you, as I was studying this passage this week, that I, I, I recognize that those four aspects, those critical experiences, are so much along the same lines of the way that the enemy works in our lives? The enemy wants to isolate you. Do you know that? He wants to isolate you from the family of God. He wants to use difficult circumstances like Daniel and his friends are facing, trials, challenges, things that you're going through to, to cause you to be at an arm's distance from the people of God. It's so amazing to me after 30 years of pastoring to recognize that sometimes when the rubber meets the road and life begins to fall apart, that one of the first things that people do is stop coming to church. We're, why? Because we're frustrated. God, this isn't how it was supposed to go. And maybe we even look around like Daniel did in, in Babylon and say, all these people are flourishing and here am I, a slave, a fugitive, a captive. How many I can play with you? I can mess with you. The enemy wants to isolate you. He also wants to indoctrinate you. He wants you to think to yourself that the things that are going on around you, the things of this world are no big deal. Everybody does it. It's normal. And he wants to rob you of your sense of conviction, your devotion. And he'll do that oftentimes through intimidation, right? We live and work in a world where it's intimidating, right? Sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to take that place of courage amongst secular ideas and, and pagan ideas. And the enemy wants to use that to try to beat us down. And then at the very last moment, the thing that he wants to do as well is to redesignate us. He, he comes as an accuser of the brethren to say, you're not a believer, you're a sinner. You're not victorious, you're a loser. Look what you're doing, look what you've done. 
How many see how the enemy works in the same way? If you study these, these vital experiences, you'll recognize that's exactly what, what gangs do. Those same four steps, that's exactly what cults do. They see someone lost, hurting, broken. They want to isolate, indoctrinate, intimidate, redesignate. But God's calling us to be rooted and ground, planted in who we are as men and women of God. Amen? Those things are lies of the enemy. And I want to remind you today, don't allow yourself to be isolated. When times get difficult, run to your family of God. Be the first one here, the last one to leave. Seek wise counsel. Reach out for encouragement. Because the things that the enemy is trying to do against you and me, just like Daniel and his friends, are lies from the enemy. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. Amen? We are victorious in Jesus Christ. And I want to say this to you. You are stronger than you think. You're going to make it through. Why? Because your life is built upon Jesus. Let's look at verse 8 together. But Daniel, so we've seen this story so far. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, again, Daniel's 15 years old. He said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. And give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. And then treat your servants in accordance with what you see. And so he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard took away their choice food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Does it say that to these young men, the school that they went to gave them knowledge and understanding? Can I tell you as well that their appearance, their fitness, their health was not purely a direct result of eating vegetables. This is not a vegetarian sermon, which I think that's great if that's what you want to do. That's what God's called you. But again, this is not the point. Just like we see, oh, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Judah. No, God gave Judah into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar for a purpose and a plan. They purposed to eat vegetables and water because that probably what was available to them outside of the delicacies of the king. And God used their, their purpose, their conviction, their resolve, their faith to elevate them. And then we see God giving them incredible favor. Amen? And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. These men came and stood before the king of Babylon. And the king talked with them. And he, can I tell you that, that even the fact that they had audience with the king was God's favor. How many, see the, how many see what's going on here? What happens, what happens when we resolve to love God, to trust God, and obey God? It doesn't matter what's going on around us. God's working behind the scenes for our good and for his glory. There is favor from the Lord that we haven't even tapped into yet that God is absolutely delighted to give us and he's calling us to another place of devotion, family. To put us before kings. To cause us to flourish and increase. That's the heart of God. And so the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better. Everybody say ten times. 
Then all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom, and there Daniel remained until the first year of King Cyrus. He didn't just find them ten times better than the fellow captives or fugitives. He found them ten times better than his top guys. Amen? Tenfold, fiftyfold, a hundredfold is what God has for us. And the Bible says that Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Can I tell you that that last verse, don't miss that? That's just not a historical context. What does that tell us? That tells us that God gave Daniel influence. It was four kings between Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus. Four kings, including Nebuchadnezzar and Cyrus, that Daniel had influence in their courts. He remained in that high place ten times. I want to just center in as we close this morning on verse 8. But Daniel resolved. How many love the verses in the Bible that begin with the word but? Right? But God. Genesis 50, 20. Joseph speaks to his brothers and he says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Psalm 73, verse 26, the psalmist writes, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Come on, somebody. Romans 5, 8, Paul writes, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And now we see Daniel following in the footsteps of his heavenly father. And he says, because he knows the law, if I see the shift, shift. if I see the tide change with the words, but God, I want it to be said of me, but Daniel, like my God. How about you? How about what's going on right now in your life? How about all of it, good, bad, and ugly, except that this is the thing that is said, but Scott. All of this was happening to Kimberly, but Kimberly, but Yudi, but John. But Brooke, amen, but Nancy, yeah, man, God, what, how, how are they even surviving this? But Billy, how many know that's what God wants to be said of our lives, amen? So Daniel's a captive in a foreign land. He can't do anything about that. He's isolated. He's overwhelmed. He's being forced to learn things that he doesn't believe and that he doesn't want to learn. Even his name has been taken away. But not this. Daniel says, I know who I am. And I know whose I am. And he resolved in his heart. Family, I've said this to you before. And I believe it with all of my heart. That when you know who you are. And I'm talking about not your natural identity. But your spiritual identity. When you know who you are and you know what God's word says about your life, your decisions are already made for you. You just need the courage to walk in them. And look, everybody, look at me. You have that courage. You do. You have it because the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you. You have the ability to draw that line in the sand for you and for your family. You have that line, even if you've been messing up, even if you've kind of fallen into the conformity of the things around you, maybe in your job, in your family, in your friends, in your neighborhood, you have the ability to set that resolve and say, no more, but Brian, I'm gonna step into the fullness and the provision of God for my life. I'm not gonna be conformed to the things around me. I'm gonna be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I'm gonna let the word of God tell me who I am. Anytime you ever lack your value, look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes, these men were good-looking and young and an aptitude for learning and well-spoken. They were self-aware. They were emotionally intelligent. But that's not what made the difference. What made the difference is who they were on the inside, their courage, their devotion. Amen? And then what do we see from God? Here's the thing I want us to come back to here now, is what do we see from God in this passage? We're seeing Daniel. We're seeing the hand of God in Daniel. We're seeing the character of God in Daniel. But what do we see about the character of God? We see that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen? He's a rewarder. 
his blessings untold for us. He's, he has a plan to cause us to be the head and not the tail. He has, a call, he has a purpose to promote and bring increase. And he's looking for men and women of God who have the resolve of Daniel. To say, God, I'm going to honor you in everything that I do. Do you believe that God will do the same for you? Do you believe that God will do the same for you? Can I encourage you with this truth, family? I believe that there are many times where we, we come just short of the miracle that God has in store for our life and for our situation. And the reason that we do is because we don't put our faith into practice. We believe it. We say that we know it. But the Bible says that we are to be a people who put our faith into practice. There's so many depths of what it means to walk in the kingdom of God that are awaiting us that we basically are just at the front door. And God says, no, use the key, the word of God, the discernment of the Holy Spirit. Open the door and don't just look in like this. Step in to the fullness by faith. If I could encourage you with this one thing as you leave today, every one of you in this room has a measure of faith, even if it's just a mustard seed. If you'll put it into practice, you're going to see mountains moved. You're going to see doors open. You're going to see God's plan and provision for your life. Amen? And when you are in the midst of that trial and the enemy wants to isolate you, when he wants to indoctrinate you, intimidate you, even redesignate you, don't give yourself an excuse to, to give in. Daniel didn't make excuses because he was living with purpose. Right? He could have rationalized, everybody's doing it. We better just go along with it. But instead he resolved in his heart not to defile himself. Amen? Let me ask you a question this morning. I want you to think about your life in this regard. Are you a thermometer or a thermostat? And I'm talking about your faith, your resolve, who you are in Christ. Are you a thermometer that goes up and down based upon the environment around it? That's not who God's called us to be. Or are we a thermostat? A thermostat regulates the temperature. Amen. A thermostat says, I know who I am. Yeah, it's chaos around me, but I live in the peace of God. Yeah, I don't see the answer. I don't, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I don't have to know it to trust it because I trust God. Yeah, I don't, I don't have to do what everybody else is doing to get ahead. In fact, I could set myself apart and know that God is going to give me favor that no man can take away. Amen. God is calling us to another level of faith, family. And that's so much what this series is going to be about. I believe God's going to change us. How about you? How many would say like me, Lord, you've changed me, but keep changing me. We're going to get through the end of this series, and our faith is going to absolutely blow the ceiling off this place. Come on, somebody. Amen. As we understand who we are and whose we are in God. So listen, I want to give you a few minutes to talk about this around the table, and then we'll pull you back and close our service. God bless you.